Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to speak here today, especially to all my Portuguese compatriots. It's been quite a while since I've been to Portugal, more than a year now, and I look forward to visiting back soon, if possible. So for this uh, presentation, I'm just going to really give a, a general outline of the research activities we have ongoing in the Rob Finn's microbioinformatics team at API, and then focus a bit more on the work that I did in the past few years. So I was trying to put together this presentation. I was trying to find the most recent photo of our team. Really, the latest I could get was from 2018. Our team here has undergone a, a massive restructuring, actually. So a lot of people also have left and new people have come in. But one, one thing that you can see here is all how happy we were and oblivious to what was going to happen in, in the next few years. And obviously, not, now, like most of you, I imagine, things have drastically changed. And uh, I think it's to the day, it's been one year since we all started working from home and most of us have not been on campus for, for, yeah, for a year at least. Uh, so this is us, we still try to find ways to still socialize and have fun. And this is us uh, last year during our, our Christmas party. Okay, so now moving on to the science. So our microbiome informatics team is essentially structured into two main arms. So there's um, the service side of things that manage the magnified platform. So this platform is really for allowing large-scale metagenomic analysis. So users can submit their data through here and process them through our own standardized pipelines. And then this gives them the advantage to actually compare their data sets with tens of thousands of other data sets that we already have available on our site. However, I'm not going to really be focusing on this for this talk, as Rob is actually going to be covering this in the afternoon session. So look forward to that. What I really wanted to talk about a bit more is on the research activities we have ongoing in our team. So our research team is uh, relatively recent and new. So we, Rob's team only really started in 2018 on the, on the research side of things. And we have been steadily growing and increasing. And at the moment, we're pretty much covering lots of different uh, topics, everything from resources and tools, looking at different types of organisms, archaea, viruses, eukaryotes. And we're not really just focusing on one biome in specific. We have projects that focus on the human gut, but we also have other projects that span multiple environments and biomes. Now, if I really had to, to pick sort of an overarching theme for our group, it's really all about using uh, metagenomics tools to really obtain novel biological insights while at the same time providing new resources and tools for the community to drive further discovery. And to illustrate this, I'd just like to briefly mention the different projects we have in our team and then I'll focus a bit more on what I did in my postdoc. So Alejandra, she's um, a postdoctoral fellow uh, at DBI. She's actually shared between Emble BI and the Wellcome Sanger Institute. And her project is mostly focused on obtaining new insights into the gut microbiome by using long read sequencing. So we all know that short read sequencing has dominated most uh, genomic efforts until now, but we recognize that using short reads, we are limited in terms of uh, the amount of sequence data we can recover. As it, you can see, for instance, here in the middle, when you're trying to do the assembly of all these sequences, there are genes that are not able to be assembled with uh, short read sequencing alone. So what Alejandro is doing is really trying to find whether the functions, whether the genes that we recover with long read sequencing that we are not able to find with short reads alone. And she's now focusing specifically on these types of, of genes transposases that allow the mobilization of genes across bacteria and specifically looking at insertion sequences contained within in these transposases. And, and she has actually found that lots of the insertion sequences she's finding in, in these uh, genomes are actually very distantly related to standard database of IS finders. She's now exploring this further and actually providing all these data as a unified resource as well. Felix, so Felix is a PhD student in our team and he's, um, his project is about developing a search system to manage the huge amount of information we have on the Magnify uh, platform. So at the moment we have over 1 billion protein sequences within the Magnify platform. And what Felix is doing is trying to essentially link the protein sequences with all the metadata we have on the website, in addition to the genomes that are derived from these proteins to try to link everything together. So once we have, let's say a set of proteins, 
we can know the genomic context of these proteins and then link back to their annotations and to which bacteria they're found to discover uh, novel proteins and even clarify what might be the function of proteins with a known function, and then look at also uh, new bioactives. So uh, Felix has been sort of benchmarking and testing this search system using a particular uh, case study of this new PKS biosynthetic gene cluster that was discovered in E. coli that seems to be somewhat related with incidence of colorectal cancer. Now, Paul is also a PhD student in our team, and he has been working and applying a new tool to evaluate the quality of eukaryotic genomes. So in, in our field, essentially, a lot of biases exist for uh, bacteria. So a lot of the tools and a lot of the methods that have been used so far are only appropriate for bacteria and even to some extent archaea, but little has been done for eukaryotes. So, uh, Paul has essentially developed a tool that uses a set of, of marker genes to evaluate the, the level of completeness and contamination of several eukaryotic genomes. So this tool called UCC has now been published and is, is publicly available. And what Paul now is doing is sort of going beyond that, further refining this tool, but also applying, applying this to, to find novel eukaryotic genomes and species across multiple biomes. Uh, Santiago, so Santiago is a software developer in our team, so he bridges a bit more the, the research and the service side of things. And he's, he works on a project called Emerald, whose idea is, is essentially about using artificial intelligence to discover novel secondary metabolites in metagenomic data. So what Santiago is doing is he's developing a tool using machine learning to actually leverage uh, in-depth annotations such as those present in Interpro, uh, another EMBL resource, and then see whether he can detect biosynthetic gene clusters in metagenomic data, and then whether he can pre accurately predict the borders of these biosynthetic gene clusters. And he has done a bit of benchmarking with other tools like Anti-Smash and BGC, and he found that his Emerald tool actually is able to predict very nicely the borders and the, the presence of these biosynthetic gene clusters. And Sarah, so Sarah is uh, also a PhD student. She's uh, actually shared between EBI and the NIH in the US. And what she's doing is doing a very in-depth analysis of the skin microbiome, but actually pairing culturing efforts with metagenomics. So she has a very detailed sampling of about 12 individuals that were sampled across various uh, skin and body sites. And she's using the, the cultured isolates, but also Shopkin metagenomic sequencing obtained from these skin body sites to identify which species, which functions are actually present within the skin microbiome. Now, focusing a bit more on my work, I just have a few slides just explaining what I have done in the last few years. Um, my project has essentially centered around studying the human gut microbiome. Obviously, you all know how important the human gut microbiome has been uh, for the last few years, not only because of the, the vast richness and the diversity that is found in the gut, but also because of its increasingly uh, association with human health in various contexts. And essentially, to, to contextualize a bit, to the way that we can analyze the gut microbiome, we can pretty much take two, two main approaches. So one is, let's say you have a stool sample and you want to actually analyze and retrieve the individual isolates. So you want to try to culture them so you'd be able to then perform uh, experiments either in vivo or in vitro. Another approach that has obviously been gaining a lot of attention is using metagenomics to directly sequence the DNA and recover um, the, the species that perhaps you are not able to culture in the lab. So what I've been essentially doing in my postdoc is trying to compare what do we find using metagenomics, what species, what organisms do we detect through this method that have not yet been cultured in the lab and we're actually missing by just limiting ourselves to, to culturing efforts. Now, I'm not going to really go into the details of the methods, so, um, the methods that we use, but to cut a, a very long story short, using metagenomics, we were able to identify almost 2,000 new bacterial species in the human gut. To contextualize a bit the numbers, so at the time that we did this study, there were only about 500 cultured species, so we essentially more than tripled the number of known species in the human gut. I have indicated here on, on the left a phylogenetic tree with all the species that we detected. The ones here in green indicate the novel and cultured species we detected uh, through metagenomics. Whereas in blue, these are all the cultured ones that were previously known. And you can see here on the outer part of the tree, it's just the, the phylum annotation. 
So what is clear is that there, there's a lot that is still missing within the human gut bacterial realm. One thing that we also found by looking at the functions of these species is that they seem to lack a lot of genes involved for oxygen resistance. So we do recognize that a lot of the cultured species are also strict anaerobes, but our hypothesis is that many of these uncultured species perhaps are one step above and might actually be even more sensitive to any sort of oxygen exposure when compared to, to what has been cultured so far. Now, as a follow-up to this work, there were actually um, concurrently a lot of different studies that did similar analysis in, ex in expanding the number of genomes of the human gut. So what we did was actually compile all the different data sets that were released at the time and have a unified resource of the human gut bacterial uh, genomes. So we have made this resource now openly accessible since in the last year. And we're currently working towards maintaining and updating this, this resource as, as we go forward. So the, just to conclude, so this project really what provided was a, a massive expansion to our knowledge of the human gut microbiome, providing new reference points for a lot of different species that we didn't really know much about. So that means now when we're trying to look at which species might be linked with disease, we have a more expanded map. We have a reference for all these different organisms that we didn't really know much about. So I'd just like to uh, acknowledge the, all the members of our team at the Microbiome Informatics and also our collaborators from the same institute. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Well, Shen, thank you very much for your talk. <clears throat> and we do have time for a few questions unless Luis tells me otherwise. Good. Let's just have a couple of questions, okay? Okay, very good. Yeah. So I have a question here by Isabel Gordo. Hi, Alexander. Thanks, thanks a lot for the nice talk. So um, if I understand correctly, we are missing quite a lot of uh, species. Um, but, but what I was wondering is, in terms of functions, are we missing a lot of functions? So one thing that is clear from our studies is that about 40% of the proteome that we detect in the human gut, we, we really don't have anything, any idea what they're doing. So mm -hmm. just based on genomes alone. So either we don't have any hits to, to current annotation databases, or even if we do, they hit hypothetical proteins that we don't really know much about. So on that observation alone, yes, there's still a lot of things that we probably don't know about. Now comparing the functions between the new species that I detected and the existing ones, one obvious thing that came out was actually differences in carbohydrate utilization genes. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, different types of enzymes and different types of genes that, with different affinities for different types of sugars, which makes sense. Obviously what is cultured is biased towards the conditions that were used to culture those bacteria. So, but again, it's really hard to go further than that because looking just at individual genes, there's not really much we can say about what are the, the, the exact function of all, of all these, these, these pathways and all these bacteria. Thanks. Okay, there's another question uh, by Philip Engel. Yes, and hello. Then... <clears throat> hey, Alex, thanks a lot. I had actually a similar question, but I, uh, I had another point. Um, in your phylogenetic tree of your uncultured microbes that you recovered from this metagene, there was one clade <clears throat> a pretty large clade of closely related strains or species. So can you comment on it? It's pretty intriguing that there's a, there's a specific group from which you recovered many different um, MACs, um, but with, for which you have no isolate yet. Can you comment on it? Yeah, exactly. This always stands out. It, it's funny because it always stands out when I, when I present that tree. So this, this group is actually the colon cell genus. So the reason why we have such an expansion in the tree is that, so when I built this tree, essentially I dereplicated all my genomes at a so-called species level, so 95% nucleotide identity. The problem is that for colon cella, this 95% nucleotide identity barrier doesn't work as well. So it's more, so the genus is more of a continuous divergence. So if I use 92, if I use 96, I would have gotten different results. Mm -hmm. So what you see is that you have lots of very similar species that probably should just be considered its own sort of species mm -hmm. complex. So it's more, so the, the, the expansion of the tree is more of a sort of an artifact of the clustering rather than a real kind of biological. I see. Yeah, thanks. 
Well, we also have two community members which behave similarly. So that's interesting to see that. Yeah, yeah thanks. I'll change there is one last question from uh, Nancy Moran. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought it was very interesting, your idea that sort of more extreme oxygen sensitivity might be why um, some of these haven't been cultured. Um, but of course, in real life, they have to get between hosts, right? Which means, in general, it's a fecal oral route, and they probably are exposed to oxygen at some level during transmission. And I sort of, so that made me think of Adriano's earlier talk about um, spore formation. If they tend to be spore formers also, that might be the key to transmission. Yeah, that, that's, that. yeah that's a fantastic point. So we have actually parallel projects exploring this question. And if you look at the tree, it def definitely there's a massive expansion of firmicutes. And many of those firmicutes are, are spore formers. So that's a great point. Yeah, even though uh, they might not be able to resist oxygen when they produce spores and they transmit, they will be resistant to, to any sort of adverse environmental uh, conditions. So yes, this is something we're now exploring further and, and seeing if it does have a, a, an effect.